So now the next talk, an overview of non-mainstream languages about parallel programming. So Lens, who are you Lens? Well, you all know that when uh, in, those, in this sort of conferences you are requested to write a short bio and, and we all know that it's the person that writes, it's not the other. But I, I love the first and the last sentence of Lenz. So he starts saying that Lenz Gunschwater is a true geek. So which is not a big thing here, but it's... Uh, but the, what, what I love is the last sentence. We say Lenz likes Pearl Erlang and life in New Zealand. Which it's something that for, how can I say, a guy coming from Germany two, three years ago, it's a, it's a nice change. Um, Lenz... It also runs the functional programming group in Wellington. It's a strong interest in concurrent programming. It's always on the look for the optimal tool for the job. So we work together in at Open Parallel, which is a small consultancy shop that we started a few months ago. Uh, but he was previously the CTO of United Domains in Germany and technical director at Lycos Europe. And you're ready to go. So please welcome Lenz. Way my computer to not fall okay. So. <laughs> okay. Um, does that work? Do you hear me? Yeah. All good? Sweet. Yeah, so I'm between you and the coffee break. Um, hope you bear with me for a while. Um, I talk about, surprisingly, parallel programming. But. Um, You've heard a lot about parallel programming today, and I don't want to bore you with other special aspects of how do you do your memory management and things. I'll much rather like you to take you on a journey through a couple of different ways how to actually do parallel programming. And I'll probably start briefly with how I learned parallel programming, which has nothing to do with nice CPUs and shiny um, threads and shiny languages and all that. It was pretty plain, simple internet business. We had a lot of people hammering our website and we had to scale that shit. And it was awful. Because the stuff we came up with was horrible. We used databases as message queues. We did a lot of PHP stuff that didn't scale really well. We had front ends that were mangled into the back ends and it was horrible. It was typical dot-com startup code that no one wants to look into it. Um, so I came up with my kind of back-end thing that scaled roughly and morphed into a small message passing environment and was all written in really, really nice Perl at that time. Um, communicated with my nice PHP stuff in the front end through databases and message. Anyway. It was, it was a really, really rough journey, but what I learned out of it was um, you can scale that stuff and you can kind of come up with interesting concepts, but the longer you dig, the uh, more you, you actually realize that someone else been there before. And I stumbled upon Erlang, which is a, a really, really nice message passing environment. And um, Erlang is, um, is a language that comes out of telco is specially designed for, for concurrency of something that is network bound, ideally. And um, it just kind of opened my eyes and was, hey, probably I should have looked around a bit more instead of just ran off and thought I know it. And this is why I'll take you on a journey today through a couple of different languages that might be interesting for you to not run off into certain direction and kind of hit your wall against, uh, hit your head against the wall and just kind of try to solve something that's been solved a couple of times already in other languages. <coughs> um, just briefly, I want to talk quite a bit about functional programming because that's kind of one of my passions. Um, I'll talk briefly about high performance computing systems and I have two languages that I'm a bit more passionate about as well. I kind of want, want to stress to you as well. 
but they're kind of old school, really old school. Um, another thing, I'm not a pro in all the languages I'm showing you today. I'm a Perl hacker, I'm a Erlang guy, I know a lot about fu functional programming languages because I run a functional programming user group in Wellington, but please feel free to shout out and kind of tell me more about the languages that I have up here. Um, I think some of you might be better than me in a lot of the languages up there. Um, but before we dig into that, I, I kind of want to just raise the, the thing that knowing one language doesn't really help you. If you learn more than one language, it also talks, uh, teaches you um, to think in a different way. Like, I'm, I'm Bavarian originally, and beer is something that is kind of one of our base nutritions, and it's really something we grew up with from small. But something I really only learned in, in New Zealand was that you actually drink lots of beer to get wasted, and that's the only purpose. You don't drink it because you like it. And that was a different mentality that I learned. And every language tells you not only the words, it also tells you a mentality. It also tells you a different way of looking at things. And this is why I think functional programming languages especially um, are very, very important to know at least one, just because it bends your mind around what computing can be other than declarative kind of going top to bottom. Um, this is a very small kind of selection of functional programming languages, mainly, not only, uh, that I want to go over today. And I try to come up with a graph of influences, like which languages kind of influence the other ones. And we'll come back to that one um, later in the talk. But one of the languages you see at a very kind of high level is Lisp. And Lisp is important, um, because Lisp was kind of the first real high-level language that tried, to, um, that tried to come up with, with high-level concepts uh, other than, than just kind of plain assembly. Um, and it's, it's only, the, it's, I think, the second oldest high-level language other than Fortran, which was, I think, a year earlier, but correct me on that one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, third. <laughs> I'm too young for that. <laughs> um, it, was, it was written by John McCarthy on, on the MIT. Has a has a big, strong background in, in artificial intelligence research, and um, I think it's it's a, it's an interesting approach to write languages, and it's such, such a, a simple concept um, that a lot of Lisp dialects got implemented in other bigger programs and languages just as a, as a kind of a subset. One of the inter interesting things as well is um, the Lisp guys always thought that memory management is way too precious to leave it to the user, so they implemented a garbage collector right away. Um, and this is very different to all the C guys who think it's way too precious to leave it to a machine. So <laughs> they're really kind of... But um, that makes Lisp very, very easy to kind of start wrapping your head around as well. You don't have to worry about memory management, you just kind of get going. And to give you an idea how Lisp looks like, and yes, this is one of the biggest critiques of Lisp, all the brackets at the back, never forget one, need an editor that actually highlights it. But if you look at it, it's very simple. If you look at the innermost bracketed things, you have a function in the beginning and then an arguments that just apply to that function. So it is from the notation to learn, it is actually pretty straightforward. Any questions about Lisp? <laughs> Don't hammer me with it. <laughs> the second very important language I think is ML. ML influenced a lot of other functional programming languages. And it's, it's a, not as old as Lisp, but it's from the 70s. Um, and was designed for, for research purposes mainly, for proving mathematical things, for proving, um, proving functions. And it's called ML, meta language. And um, it has, um, this is garbage collected as well. It's a theme you will probably notice throughout a lot of um, the functional programming languages that they kind of 
averse to manual man uh, memory management. They, they like to hand it off to some automatic thing. Um, and ML has a, has a very different kind of notation. So, so standard ML kind of looks like. Um, and if you look at that notation and um, keep it in mind for, for later slides, there's a very, very dense notation, a very short one. ML is, is kind of died out, but its main uses today is standard ML or CAMEL. And uh, standard ML is, is kind of more in the, in the research area. And CAMEL itself was originally um, implemented in, in Lisp and was known for its resource greed mainly. And then some guys said, okay, we like CAMEL, but the resources it needs is just ridiculous. So they rewrote it in, in C and came up with CAMEL Lite. And um, that kind of moved in the meantime into OCaml, more or less. And OCaml is probably the CAMEL dialect that you want to pick if, you want, if you've never picked up one of those ones. Probably OCaml is the one you, you, you should start with. And um, the, the syntax looks, looks pretty much the same. It's, it's still, it still looks like ML. It's just it has, OCaml has more syntactic sugar around it. It has objects. It has more, um, more volume to the language. One language that is very, very similar, and I kind of I'm not sure if I should present that one here today, <laughs> um, is F Sharp. F Sharp is, is nearly compatible to OCaml, and it's uh, the Microsoft kind of way of, this is how functional programming works, um, comes out of Microsoft Research, was built in, or kind of around 2002, and um, it's really the Microsoft approach of, of including something in the .NET um, environment that can deal with, with functional programming. Um, I think it's an interesting development because this strange F sharp thing drove a lot of guys to my functional programming user group. They suddenly have this in their .NET thing and they don't know what it is and they kind of get curious about functional programming. And I think this is a, an important thing or development because it just raises awareness about anything. There is something beyond C sharp in that case or .NET which is horrible enough. Um, and it's, F, F sharp is, is kind of a, knows both worlds. It is functional. You can use functional programming concepts, but you can also use object-oriented programs uh, concepts, and you can, you can blend it with uh, C sharp if you want to. This is roughly how it looks like. And uh, heavily, yeah, looks a bit like, like OCaml. The next one I want to briefly talk about is Erlang. Erlang is a, a special passion of mine. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting functional programming language as it is a, a pure message passing environment. It has a shared nothing architecture. Um, you can't really, if you try really hard, you can write code that interferes with each other. But it is normally really strictly encapsulated. Every process you spawn is on its own. And the only way to communicate between all those processes is by passing messages around. And this makes Erlang a very interesting language to scale. It literally doesn't make an, a difference if you run your code base on one virtual machine or on one virtual machine on one or on several virtual machines on one physical machine or on like 200 physical machines across the globe. Erlang doesn't care um, as long as those machines can see each other. It will just magically kind of work together. And um, the, the Erlang virtual machine that interprets the Erlang, Erlang bytecode is really a, a nicely threaded application in the meantime that can scale linear to, I think they're about around 32 cores in the moment, but they're working on, on even better scalability. So if, you, if you're talking about a lot of, a lot of concurrent Erlang processes, which are not one-to-one -to, -one to operate in system processes, um, and you have a lot of CPUs, you can definitely make use of, of the Erlang VM. The Erlang is normally bad is if you have a small problem and it is one thread. 
and you just number crunch something smaller so you can't parallelize it, then Erlang is always worse than all the other nice languages. <laughs> but if you have a big problem with a lot of network sockets, for example, or with a lot of things where you can do a lot in parallel, um, Erlang is often outperforming a lot of other languages. Um, this is how Erlang looks like. Um, also quite dense syntax. The, the syntax is, is one of the biggest critiques for Erlang and it is kind of awkward for the first time and it has all kind of those weird concepts like single assignment, you can't change a variable once you have assigned something to it and they come up with all those explanations why it is good. Um, it, is, it is awkward when you start using Erlang but once you wrap your head around it, it is very, very easy to read code. So after probably a week learning Erlang, you will be easily capable of just reading pretty much any Erlang library and you understand it, which makes it really an, a nice language to learn and a nice language to, to get going with. And the concepts are different enough that you learn something different. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is, it, uh, recursion is, is um, kind of the default thing that you do in, in pretty much any functional programming language. <laughs> yeah, it is tail recursive. And it has higher, uh, higher order functions, so you can return functions, you can treat functions as data, you can do all those nice things that you do in other functional programming languages. So just to clarify, this isn't only a functional language as well. It's a nice language to write functional programming, but you can write those, you can write imperative style code. You can. Yeah, just not <laughs> Yeah, but it's, if you, you can even write code with side effects if you want to. If you try really, really hard, you can, you can do that. And for some things, it is, it is important that you can, but the language is designed around side effect free code. And if you have a look at the language shootout, some of the more efficient and interesting ones, they read a lot like C, where they've basically done more of the Those whole comparisons between languages are normally tailored towards one specific problem, sp problem space. If you design a language shootout around writing a web server, I'm pretty sure there are other languages succeeding than if you design a language shootout around crunching an algorithm than if you design a language shootout around. So it, it, I, I don't give too much about those numbers that come out of those competitions because they normally dissolve the, the image of a language because you really try hard to tailor your code towards exactly this problem. But a language is way more than, than fixing one specific problem, I think. Um, Haskell. Haskell is another very important functional programming language um, that kind of struggles to get out of this research notion that it is in. It's very, very often told at, uh, ta uh, taught at, at universities and, and kind of struggles to get into the real life coding world. But um, they're actually uh, doing quite some work in the moment around um, threading and uh, about a multi-threaded uh, hash color compiler. And they, there is um, some, some interesting support by the, the hash color by some of the Haskell guys to get real-world implementations that are really large and they kind of to demo the, the threaded implementations they have um, of Haskell to, to demo them to a, to a larger audience. And Haskell is in, in an interesting language in that respect that it's a, a pure language. So it is, um, it is side effect free, it is lazy in ev evaluation, it is um, kind of always trying to, um, to, to go as, fast as, uh, as far as you can with, with a, with a, without evaluating all your, all your code. Um, and it has a, a very, very mighty tight, uh, type system that makes it an interesting experience to program in, uh, in, in, in Haskell, I think. 
to show you briefly what I mean is this is um, how I would define a, um, a function, which means you, you not only define a function, you also define a function plus the types that are expected as inputs and outputs in the, in the type system. And then you use the function and define actually the function and there are two different implementations. In, in fact, there, for most of the languages, I really just put up one, one possible implementation of the factorial. But um, there, are, there are, for most languages, different ways to, to, to write it. But for Haskell, I thought those two are so, so different. And uh, the second one is, is showing the Lisp processing that is so fundamental to all the functional programming languages so nicely that I put it up as well. So this is. This is a way how, how Haskell looks like, and I think it's a, it's a very clear and a very interesting way to, to define things. The next one I want to go into because it is really gaining popularity because some of the Web 2.0 startups, not so much startups anymore like Twitter and so on, they started using Scala. Um, Scala is really kind of rising up on on, in popularity, I think especially because there are all those frustrated Java guys that try to do some code that doesn't wear out the knuckles so much. And um, they, they, they are all kind of keen to, to program in a way that sucks a bit less, I think. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Scala is one of those approaches. Um, runs under JVM um, and has a, a quite, quite tight integration between Java and, and uh, Scala. And it really tries to, to bring functional programming to, to the Java community in a, in a way that, that we haven't seen before. And um, I, know, I know a lot of functional programming guys that are forced to work in some corporate environments and they have to, uh, to, to develop on the JVM. They have to work with a lot of already existing Java libraries and they are all really, really attracted to Scala because they can write in a functional way but without having to rewrite all this legacy code that is around already, so they can just tie in those libraries, use them from within Scala in a, in a functional way. And um, I've seen a, quite a bit of, of interest from, from the Java community that realize that there are those awkward functional programming guys that do some weird stuff, and Scala seems interesting, and they suddenly show up in my user groups and are interested in functional programming in general. So I think Scala looks really promising and I think is an is a important language. But on the other side, if you look at that factorial, well, honestly, if I look at other functional programming languages, I mean, looking from a Java point of view, it's, it's fine, it's dense, it's, it's not too, too verbose, but looking from a... <laughs> so, yeah. Um, there is another interesting... Um, language that uh, showed up in the last couple of years, which is Clojure. It's also running on the JVM, but it comes from a totally different angle. Clojure doesn't try to be a better Java. Clojure really tries to just use the JVM as a VM and then do, in fact, Lisp on top of it. So Clojure is really just a Lisp kind of dialect, um, actually a pretty, pretty close to Lisp dialect that uh, runs on the JVM and has some sort of macros that can tie in Java um, libraries. But it is not as convenient as Scala, and this is um, not something that I've seen so much um, interest from, from the actual Java community. I've seen uh, quite a, some interest from the, from the functional programming guys that try to write Lisp on, on the JVM, but the Java community is more biased towards um, the, the Scala language then to, to Clojure. And this is how, how Clojure looks like. It's, it's pretty, pretty much Lisp, as you would expect it. Um, the last language that I find quite interesting um, is a very, very uh, young language that just came up. I think they, they announced somewhere in autumn last year that they're actually there and they're alive. Um, it's a language that comes out of uh, the Mozilla, um, from, from some Mozilla guys, and they, they try to come up with a programming language that is easy to, to write, um, that is 
easy to write bug-free code, basically. <laughs> I really, really try to write the language in a way that you can't corrupt memory, um, and that on a, on a multi-core system and multi-operating system. So they, they develop on Linux, uh, OS X, and Windows in the moment. They develop on four plus core machines, and they try to come up with a general purpose programming language that it is, uh, is easy to, to understand, easy to write, and really, really, really hard to fuck up, basically. <laughs> so it is an interesting concept, but it is very, very early stages. Um, they have a working implementation, but they are still far from, from being a language that is complete as a language. But Rust looks very, very promising, and if you want to play around with something really new and really cutting edge, I think Rust is something you should look into. This is how Rust code looks like, um, and the lower part is how you would actually, implement, uh, actually call it. And um, the guys are really, really active. They are really heavily developing on the language in the moment, and it is certainly something worth watching. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> compile it to figure out, I think. <laughs> okay, break. We made it through the functional languages. Um, off to. Uh, sorry, before you continue, was there a question oh, sorry. in the back? Uh, oh, oh. Ah, okay. We can. Have you looked into it at all? I haven't looked too much into Clojure. Uh, I am not so much a JVM fan. That's my whole problem. Does, uh, can you give him the, the yeah. microphone? Just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to repeat everything. So it's about the parallel features in the Clojure engine. Yeah, um, Clojure is also designed from the ground up to be a parallel programming language. Uh, language. They use um, STM, uh, shared transactional memory approach to concurrency, and all of the data structures in Clojure are very carefully written to be immutable and yet efficiently updatable. So you can make a copy, but it's kind of a shallow copy, and then you can kind of update just the little bits that you've changed. So it lets you not have shared state but not be horribly inefficient at the same time and they have an they take an approach like database servers do where um, a number of threads can be trying to modify different things in transactions and basically the first one to finish succeeds and all the other ones just retry so stm is, a, is an interesting uh, memory management concept for the ones that have you how many of you know stm okay it's a big chunk <laughs> So STM basically treats, or in a very, very simplified way, STM is, is memory treated as a, as a database that has transactions. Um, and you, you simply transform transactions, or perform transactions on, on, the, on the memory, and you can roll them back. And, um, and the Haskell has some, some support for STM um, only for for pure code, not for code that has side effects like you. You couldn't use it in, in monads that actually have I.O. interference or something like that. So it is part of, um, part of the Haskell functionality if you, if you treat the, or if you take the, the right subset of the language. Um, it's used in a couple of other ones. Uh, STM is certainly interesting because it um, doesn't lead you to corrupt your, your memory um, so easy. The other way is, is uh, just, just um, to use message passing like Erlang did, uh, does um, to get around the whole shared, shared memory and locking issue. Um, you can actually use STM with IO actions. You just need to write your own rollback hooks. Ah, okay. So you need to write your own unfire the missiles if you're going to use fire the missiles in a transaction, okay. just in case you have to roll back. Just roll back the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for? Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, you mentioned Rust, which is a fairly immature language, but a, a language which is also very new, but uh, 
much more mature than Rust, but in a similar vein is Go. And I wondered if you'd looked at that and if you had any thoughts on that. Um, Go is interesting. Um, Go is Go is kind of, or Google is kind of big enough to push Go. <laughs> but honestly, I haven't seen too much uptake in the communities I am in. So this is why I haven't included it, but included Rust, which definitely has no community uptake in the moment because it's really, really new. <laughs> but Go is, Go is an interesting approach, but I'm honestly not sure which gap it's trying to fill. Because for the problem space Go is trying to to run into and the, or trying to, to fill, um, there are a couple of other languages that already have a bigger community around it. And I, I haven't seen any substantial project within Google using Go. So why would I need to look into it, kind of? I don't see the need for it, really. I think so there is. What are, what are the languages that you think Go is like, in the same space? Well, I think Go is in the same space like a couple of those JVM based ones. Like like Scala, for example. I think Scala is a strong a strong reason to not look into Go. <laughs> and the, from from the other end, it's F sharp because the corporate guys they they're really kind of looking for something that has big IDE support that has big companies behind it. Well, Google is big, but not in in a way of of writing languages. So I'm I'm not sure which. Which is the niche for, for Go really in the moment? A, a huge distinction between those two languages and Go, and full disclosure, I work on the Go team. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. It's just that it's not like Go compiles to native code, whereas that's JVM and CLR, which are you know two runtimes. So if you're talking runtime, just native code. I get into something later on in the yeah. talk that probably. It's another Just contender five minutes for that. No, 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 no. <laughs> so it's, um, we still have five, seven minutes. There is a question there or late? No, I have more slides. Please. <laughs> so we continue, the then we go questions. Thank you. OK. Um, I wanted to quickly go into the high performance, uh, high productivity computing systems, which was a challenge by DARPA. Um, started in 2002 to find the next big language we are all writing in. Um, that was basically an open challenge to a couple of big guys in the, in, the, in the computing world to come up with a language that is easy to write for research, uh, researchers and probably the military um, that is um, fast enough to complete problems in, a, in an endless time and um, that scales really nicely to many, many CPUs, possibly thousands. Um, to run on, on big machines. So that was kind of the, the, the cornerstones DARPA put out. And um, the, the three main companies that kind of survived the first and second round were IBM, Sun, and Cray. IBM with a language called X10. Um, Sun with a language called Fortress. And Cray with a language called Chapel. And Cray dropped out the next, Sun dropped out the next, so we are left with IBM. And um, IBM's X10 is kind of an interesting thing that goes into the Go direction. <laughs> As it is, it has basically two compiler backends. It is either running on the JVM or it can compile down to C++ and then to native code. And, um, it is written in a way that it is possible to actually add more, more backends if needed. And the idea behind, C, uh, behind X10 is to, to have a language that is really, really simple for researchers, but also that you can write it basically or develop it on your, on your machine with the JVM backend, easy to set up, easy to hook into an IDE, and so on. And then if you need it to scale, you just push it through the other backend, and you actually get proper code that scales nicely. Um, and if IBM succeeds in the next couple of years, we're all programming in X10 in a year or two or five or never. And um, we will all write this nice new language. It's basically a hybrid between Java and a couple of other ideas on how to write a, a language. Um, one interesting thing of uh, how they got to got around the locking issues that you have in multi, uh, multi um, in parallel programming is 
therefore parent-child locking mechanism. So you basically tell a parent, you're doing this trial, the parent spawns n amounts of trials, and a child can never lock a parent, but only a parent can lock a child. So this is how they try to, to solve the locking issue. And um, yeah, DARPA thinks that IBM did it with X10. Let's see where, if we hear about X10 in the next couple of years. Um, the next one is, the other one is Fortress from Sun. I think we're running out of time. Um, it's basically the concepts of Fortran um, blended with um, a syntax of Scala, Haskell, kind of. And um, the, the interesting thing that I think about Fortress was that Sun went out and said, okay, we have researchers. They are normally used to see formulas and things. And we are actually developers. We are used to write functions and things. So they have different style sheets to display the code. So you can either write a textual representation of sinus, x, and so on, or you can put on another style sheet on the code base, and then it just does um, render it as, as mathematical functions and so on. So that's the thing. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty smart thing. But yeah, they lost out against IBM. And uh, now, I think the, the project's actually open source. Oracle didn't kill it yet, so should be somewhere available. Uh, it was open source in 2007 <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> and just briefly, we have Reborn. This one, raw VM, came out of the IBM Research um, Lab. It's actually a small talk VM. Quite interesting to look into if you're into object-oriented things. This one's actually tailored towards many core processes and is uh, another approach of IBM to tackle the many core problems. Um, this is how Factorial looks like. And then we have one undead that I would really love to see coming up. We have seen Lisp coming up. <laughs> I would love to see Prolog coming up again. It's kind of forgotten, but not really. It's still around. And there is threaded implementations of Prolog. And this is roughly how Factorial looks like. That's it. So it's uh, right on time, so well done for that. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that Lens will be more than happy to take all the questions. At the same time, it's time for coffee, so no one will say, please don't go, because you are allowed to go. But uh, question time, please. Coffee time. Question time. <laughs> Sorry, I am. Um, Oh. <laughs> Just a really quick one, Lance. Uh, one, probably the uh, most widely used language in the world which has higher order functions is JavaScript. It's yes. not in your list. No, I know. Um, and I'm sorry about it. <laughs> JavaScript is really, really interesting. JavaScript is sorry about No, 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 no. <laughs> Both. <laughs> no, actually, JavaScript is in that respect really interesting as. Um, the whole Node.js hype that comes up in a moment makes it really interesting um, to watch all those guys jumping onto JavaScript now and, yeah, we can use JavaScript on the server. And then in the same moment realizing, fuck, it's one thread. Well, <laughs> Node.js is really a newcomer. Like, there's been a JVM-based server-side JavaScript since 2000 called Rhino, and now it's yeah, called yeah, Ringo. Yeah. That's multi-threaded, and it runs reasonably on a JVM like Clojure and all the other JVM languages. So, yeah, I think the hype about Node.js is a bit funny too, since yeah, there's lots exactly. of there is cor so many cores are exploding and they're building something that only runs on one core. Yeah, and there are so many solutions out there. But it is really so often in this wonderful web industry that someone comes up with something that we've seen already five years ago and it actually works and some guys are using it and he's just using this tiny little subset of it and it's, yes, go for it. And the whole world goes crazy. And then they realize, damn, it's actually implementing problems that we've solved five years ago already. So Node.js is a typical example. Just, just to comment on that, that's not to say that introducing a new programming language is a sociology problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sociology, we have, we have lots of those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just another quick comment, because oh. I, I don't think it was mentioned. Uh, Scala also has, uh, does STM, um, like Haskell and Clojure. But Scala, not all Scala's data structures are immutable, so you have to watch out, because if you use one that is mutable, you kind of, unless you lock it inside a reference, you, yeah, it can, it can cross the trans outside of the transaction. You can mutate it outside of the transactions, which is, Kind of bad. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and the problem with Scala and STM is also that if you're hooking in uh, Trava libraries, they do memory management in a different way. So exactly, that's, that's the issue where you kind of have to look or watch out for. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Please come back.